Hello and welcome to a sunny morning in the garden of Angela Voss um, in Chartham near Canterbury. Uh, my name's William Rowlandson and uh, I'm very grateful to Jack Hunter for inviting me to participate in this lecture th series for the MA in Ecology and Spirituality. Um, and it's wonderful to do so as well because this year, 2021, marks the 10-year anniversary of my friendship with Jack um, after uh, he, re he responded to a call for papers that Angela and I put out 10 years ago when, when I was working for the Centre for the Study of Myth at the University of Kent, where I still work. And the conference was on uh, Daimonic Imagination, Uncanny Intelligence, which led to a publication uh, it, to which Jack contributed. Um, so for 10 years now we've been friends and collaborators on, on many projects, including the journal Paraanthropology. Um, and therefore I'm very excited to see the work that Jack is doing and the amazing publications that he's producing every five minutes, so it seems. Um, I'm going to be talking about wilding. Sorry, one more thing, and that is that Angela and I work for the, also for the, um, for the Centre for Myth, Cosmology and Sacred. Um, uh, and Jack is a great ally of that. Um, and it's now, um, it was formerly at the at Canterbury Christchurch University. Um, so I'm going to be talking about wilding. Um, and no doubt you've all seen that wilding has taken off. It's in the news, everything from the micro to the macro, from people's front gardens and back gardens to roadside, uh, wayside verges, um, small patches of woodland that are, are being allowed to grow out, hedgerows, um, everything from fells and moors, river systems and marine systems, all the way up to uh, mountain ranges, even countries. Wilding is an extraordinary phenomenon, and I'm exploring it um, from the perspective of a turn. Now, a turn is a really interesting one, and I've been exploring the history of turns that happen in academic thought, um, turns in relation to, for example, anthropology, turns in religious uh, studies, comparative religion, turns, as Jorge Ferrer explains, in relation to transpersonal um, psychology, the participatory turn, the turn towards something. Um, turn, it comes from the Latin tornos, um, referring to a lathe. So what I'm doing is I'm turning and turning, working and working it, uh, turning and turning again and returning. Um, and this is my exploration of, of wilding. Um, a turn of attention towards something, a turn of attention, a shift of focus towards the wild. So what is wilding? Well, strangely enough, perhaps the best way to answer what is wilding is to ask what is rewilding. Now, rewilding has its roots stretching back into the United States and North America and big open spaces um, related to wilderness areas, related to large restoration of large ecosystems, the return of apex uh, carnivores, think big cats, think bears, um, the return of keystone species such as the huge herds of herbivores roaming across the plains, um, think of the bison, um, and think of all the many, many species from animals, plants and fungi that return in these projects of rewilding in the US. Um, now rewilding is a really exciting area to explore and I've been guided partly by the writings of, uh, of Dave Foreman and uh, other writers around the, e the Earth First movement in the States. Um, but it doesn't always apply particularly well, especially here in East Kent, a land that's been thoroughly de-wilded over the many centuries. It's a land that's crisscrossed uh, since the ancient times, uh, a land of coming and going. Um, and it's a parceled up and packaged off land that's gonna be parceled up and packaged off even more um, if plans go ahead as they are currently brewing. So rewilding with that sense of bigness doesn't always apply here. Um, and indeed, this was a question that Isabella Tree, whose uh, estate at Nep is not a million miles from here in Sussex, um, she came up with this question with her project at Nep, and they opted for wilding rather than rewilding. Um, I, primarily, as she puts it, to try and scotch any rumours of the, of the creation of some kind of Jurassic Park, but also to account for the the interaction and the intervention of humans in the landscape. 
So when we look at the history of rewilding in the States, um, there are these big roadless areas. And there is, at its more extreme levels, the removal of the humans. And in fact, Dave Foreman's writing has, uh, he returns again and again and again to the Pleistocene, to the time when there were only small bands of humans roaming across the landscape. And therefore, there is this tendency with some of the writings of, uh, with some of the ideas around rewilding towards the myth misanthropic, towards the idea, as Dave Foreman once puts it, um, of the human as a virus and the human as a cancer. Now, I find this quite problematic. Problematic for two reasons. Firstly, because it's very dispiriting and it's very disheartening and it's very disempowering to consider humans to be, to consider us to be a cancerous cell, to be a blight on the landscape, even though in many respects we are. It doesn't do us any favours to think of the world in those respects. But secondly, it presents... Um, activists and environmentalists and ecologists, it does present them in some respects as being the saviours. Um, and so it's either um, desperate and dispiriting or it tends towards the messianic. So again, that's another reason it doesn't always apply in this landscape. Um, so wilding. Wilding is a similar exp exploration of how to allow ecosystems to restore, how to allow the self-will of the system to establish itself and regain its momentum. Um, and as I've been exploring more and more this similarity and this difference between wilding and rewilding, I come to see it all part of the same overall spirit of turning towards the spirit of the wild and turning towards that self-will of the wild. Because that is the commonality. The commonality clearly in both wilding and rewilding is the wild. Now we can look at this in relation to some of the other terms that are used for wilding and rewilding. In Spanish for example, I work in a department of Hispanic studies, wilding is both asilvestrar and asalvajar. But it's rewilding is resilvestrar and resalvajar. And so you haven't just got that, that tension between the A and the re, as in the wilding and the rewilding, but you've also got this, this interesting question as, what is the difference between silvestra and salvaja? Because both derive from the Latin root silver, referring to the woodland. So, when we look at the wild, the first point of reference is to consider its etymology in relation to the woods. And Walters... Um, the Anglo-Saxon word that refers to the woodland. And indeed, close to here, in fact, exactly where Nep is, um, uh, is the Weald, the, 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 the Kentish and the Sussex and the Surrey Weald. Now, the Weald is part of that, that cognate ex uh, uh, expressions of the wooded area. Um, and it's quite interesting being here in Charton, where the, the downs uh, stretch westerly from this point where they begin. And these are the downs that then become the south downs and the north downs with the weald in between. So it's quite, a, it's quite a nice spot to be right here at the beginning of what becomes the weald, to be talking about the wild. So we have to ask ourselves, what is the wild? Well, the wild, one of the ways I've been looking at the wild is to consider all the things that are the definitions of the wild that stand in some kind of contrast to the human, that stand outside the home, the domos, the oikos, and I use the word oikos as the prefix, the Greek word that then becomes a prefix for a, a economy and ecology. So we can look at a whole array of terms that refer to the wild that stand in contrast to the human, such as the savage, the furious, the feral, the ferocious, the untamed the undomesticated, the chaotic, the disordered, the disorderly, the unruly, the unruled, the wild and chaotic. These terms stretch on and on. You can think of associated terms referring to the wild, the ill-mannered, the rude, don't be wild, the beastly, don't be beastly, which in Spanish, again, bestia, bestia is the beast, and you can say to somebody, no seas bestia, which means don't be disgusting. Beast is the inhabitant of the wild. So all these terms are about that which is separate to either what the human is or what the human should be. 
You see, this is where we can see how the wild is integrally associated with the language of civilization, and I'll come back to that in a second. Okay, so when we're looking at the wild, we're looking at all these terms um, that stand in some kind of contrast. Now, I was looking at the word turn, as I described earlier, and just recently I've been reading Geoffrey Kripal's uh, recent publication um, called The Flip. And it occurred to me that the flip is a very interesting way of presenting this turn, this participatory turn, as I put it. And what I can see is in my explorations of the wild, there are significant moments that mark this turn and this flip. So the first flip that I can describe, and there's no progression of this flip, so don't worry, it's not a hierarchy of flips. Um, it's a series of different aspects of the same flip, if you like. So the first flip that I can see here is that those terms are Nonsense. That separation is nonsense. And I can explain that. So take the idea of chaos. Take the idea of disorderly. Take the idea of the wild is a chaotic location. It's not. It's beautifully ordered. It's scrupulously ordered. It's meticulously ordered. It's fantastically choreographed. And how can we experience that? Lie on the woodland floor. Lie on the woodland floor in the summer, like today, and look up and look, up the, look at the canopy and look at what's called crown shyness. Crown shyness is what has for many years been presented as this fierce competition for light between the trees. It's not. It's a graceful dance. It's a harmonious coming together to maximize the space and the, uh, the use of the light. It's a graceful coordination. Merlin Sheldrake's recent book, Entangled Life, um, explores the fantastic uh, networks of mycelial, uh, the mycelial networks that stretch beneath the forest, the, 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 the now well-known wood wide web. Again, what we have here is fantastic coordination, um, astonishing complexity, which is not the same as complication. Um, and this complexity is brilliantly ordered. So the first thing to, to, to as it were, to, to, to do away from is this idea that the wild is, is, is chaotic. It's not. It's ordered. And indeed, it's often referred to as being anarchic. Well, I can agree with that in the sense of is it an arcos, an being without arcos, a ruler. Um, and therefore, it's, it's not ruled by any one principle aside from the self-will of the wild. So it can be seen perhaps as anarchic in that sense of each will is all part of this great, uh, this, this will itself. So, and I can explore many other areas where we can, ex where we can refer to these terms that, that describe the wild as being inappropriate. Uh, the ill-mannered and the rude and the beastly. And, and, and uh, conservationists and ecologists and zoologists will all be very familiar with seeing the intricate um, behaviours and patterns and protocols of all sorts of species, whether plant or animal or fungi. So I don't need to go into any depth of that. Um, hopefully it's familiar to everyone. So there's one flip. But then another flip, and this is an interesting uh, sort of point of, of realisation. The other point of realisation is to realise the pain, the pain in the wild, and the pain that derives from precisely that separation of the terms, that separation of the terms of that which is human and that which is wild. That separation of the terms has led to immense pain and immense destruction and immense loss over many, many years. And therefore, when we look at, for example, the history of colonialism, colonialism is a, is a, is a fantastic theatre to illustrate precisely this tension between the, uh, the human and the civilised and the domesticated and the wild. Now, it's a very interesting one there. Look at the word um, uh, colonialism refers to colony, which itself refers to the Latin word colonia. And colonias, uh, the colonia was a, was, a, was a Roman outpost. That was the, very often a, the, the, the place where in the Roman Empire they established a military base, and maybe a trading base. Those were the colonias, which itself refers to the Latin word colere, um, to cultivate, to cultivate the land, which it has as the past participle cultus, which then leads to culture and cultivated. So you can see this is a very ancient tension. It goes all the way back to the birth of agriculture. Um, this idea of the demarcation between the cultivated and the uncultivated. Now, as we explore that, that, that trajectory through history, we can see how 
with the birth of, of, of modern colonialism, as it's said, from the, from, the fifth, from the 15th century onwards, um, this is a major, major, s significant part of the language. So we can look at the debates that took place in the 1500s um, between Bartolomé de las Casas, um, which led to a big debate in Valladolid in 1550 in Spain, where the arguments that were presented in relation to the just war against the Indians by a humanist scholar called Sepulveda, the arguments were precisely along the lines of these people are wild, they are savage, they are uncivilized, they are untamed, and furthermore, they are untamable. Therefore, they stand on a very clear lower rank on the hierarchy of human achievement and human beings. So this obviously was, was then, a new debate was then was in at the, at the heart of the language of, um, of the Atlantic slave trade. Again, the presentation of people as being wild and savage as justification for their ill treatment um, and for their brutal, brutal, brutal um, uh, uh, treatment at the hands of the, uh, of the slave trade. Um, and this goes all the way through. It goes through into the 1800s. We can see it in Darwin's account of the Fueguians in Tierra del Fuego in the south of um, Patagonia, these wild and savage beings. And of course, there's this inevitability that they will succumb to the march of civilization because this is the natural progress. This is the way Darwin presents it, not only in his account of the Beagle, but even later, much later, in The Descent of Man, he returns to this idea of civilized humans as being further up some evolutionary chain. It's a very problematic um, perspective. And it's most, most visible with the language of um, one-time president of the Argentine Republic, um, Faustino Sarmiento, who cultivates, and I use that word, he cultivates an entire language based around the barbarous and the civilized, and that the civilized are doing a good job by, by pushing their civilization into the barbarous lands, that the wild lands are, need to be cultivated, and the wild people need to be tamed. And so it goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on, and the great mission of colonialism, as we all know, thunders on relentlessly today. Okay, so that's another, another flip, is to realize, as I just mentioned, to realize that this division between the wild and the civilized is the cause of great, great pain. But here's another flip, and I found this one a very interesting one. And here I'm thinking of Carl Jung's um, relationship with the shadow. Now, as you probably know, the shadow, what, the, as he presents it, what we, uh, the hostility that we feel towards something very often is the manifestation of a hostility or a fear or of a hatred that, of something that we actually harbor within ourselves. Um, so this is, to me, another moment, another turn, another turn of attention to the wild is to recognize the sublimated irony of the, of the zeal to overcome the wild is pursued with great savagery, with ferocious savagery. It's a ferocious exercise to eradicate the wild. It's a savage exercise to eradicate the savage. And I can give you so many examples. We're all familiar with the example, for example, of the slaughter of the bison on the Great Plains. Now, the slaughter of the bison on the Great Plains, what could it be other than an act of great savagery um, and ruthless? So again, and we can explore the eradication of peoples, the eradication of the lands, um, the despoilation of the lands, and the creation of the wastelands. The creation of the wastelands. Now, what is a wasteland? Because wasteland is important when we're thinking about the wild. Wasteland stands in stark contrast to the wild. The wasteland is a land that has been cleared of the wild. The self-will of the wild has been annulled. The wasteland is death with no rebirth. Death with no rebirth. The wasteland is the end of the road. And the wasteland is the result of the clearing of the wild. The wasteland is sterile. The wasteland is barren. The wasteland is dead without that process and that cycle of decay and rebirth and regeneration. So this is the result of the clearance of the wild. And it's pursued, as I said, with great ruthlessness and great savagery. Okay, 
So we can see these, these flips that are occurring in our understanding of the language that we're using in relation to the wild. And here's another flip, and this is, I think, more akin to the work that Jeff um, Kripal has been exploring in terms of an epistemological and a conceptual and an ontological flip, the way we approach reality. And that is to recognise the self-will of the wild through processes of wilding and rewilding is to recognise the beinghood of the beings of the wild. Now this is really important. To see the bison as a instrument uh, that can be destroyed in order to move the people off the Great Plains, in order to starve the people and to drive them away from their lands, from their ancestral lands, is to see the bison only as an it. This is the I-it relationship, as opposed to the I-thou relationship that we see Joseph Campbell exploring, bearing on, on Martin Buber, this notion of the I-thou. The I-thou is the recognition of the personhood, the recognition of the beinghood. And this is really, really important. And this, to me, marks a very profound flip. And, it, and I'm drawing here on the language of over 10 years of looking at the daimonic, looking at the understanding of the sovereign beinghood of other beings, not just other humans. Now, this may not come as a great surprise to somebody who has pets. People always know how to interact with their pets and recognise the beinghood of their pets. But it extends to everything in the natural world. It extends to the plants and the trees and the fungi and, the, and all the creepy crawlies, all of which not only have their self-will, but are entitled to their self-will. And this is one of the principles of wilding um, and rewilding, and it goes right the way back. And this is one of the principles um, of Arna Ness's deep ecology. And this is one of the principles of Aldo Leopold's land ethic, is recognising the right to be, the right to exist, the right to beinghood of the creatures of the wild, the people with whom we share this planet. So there's another flip, therefore. Another flip is to recognise the beinghood. Now that's a very profound experience, and it leads beautifully to another flip, and perhaps there is a bit of a progress here between the one flip and the next. And here I've been guided by an amazing expression, a, a little comment that um, a Cuban poet José Les Amalima, whose works I dedicated a huge amount of time to exploring uh, for my PhD nearly 20 years ago. There's one little quote that he has in an interview which nobody seems to remark on, but I find it just so powerful. And he says when he's referring to um, uh, um, deforestation, he says, when man swings an axe, he swings against his own neck. Now what a remarkable expression that is, when man swings an axe, he swings it against his own neck. And here in this whole understanding that it's not only the recognition of the other, the recognition of an alternate self in the beings around us, it's the recognition of the shared selfhood. Now this could sound um, that level of mysticism that we see um, as one of those central uh, tenets of mysticism as William James, as Evelyn Underhill, as Walter Stace, as so many other people have explored. Um, the, the idea of unity, the idea of the unitive, um, that it, there's, a, there's a sense of oneness. It is that, but it needn't be seen in terms which are rarefied and abstract. All one has to do is to zone out in a woodland. Try and identify a particular tree in a woodland take that oak, take that ash, take that beech, take that whatever it might be, and try and explore the limits, try and explore the borders. Where is the uh, identifiable limit of this particular tree? You explore in the roots, and the roots become the nodules of the um, mycorrhizal bacteria and the fungi. You explore the interaction between the roots and the mycelial networks. So how far do you, where do you draw the line? What constitutes the tree and what constitutes the mulch and the earth? What constitutes the limits of the tree in relation to its interaction with its friends and neighbours up in the canopy? There is no border. It's a seamless, fluid border between one creature of the wild, in this case the tree and the woodland, and all its neighbours. 
And yet, this is what I find so encouraging about this, this is not necessarily a uh, ego dissolution and a sense of loss of the individual within the collective ocean. It's not a drop that's dropped into the ocean and that just disappears, because that tree nevertheless still stands. And indeed, get a guy with a chainsaw and he will show you quite clearly how he can remove that tree. And they do, with great ferocity. And this is how I can see the woodland as an as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an image to represent us all as beings, and that is as both uh, individual and sovereign, as that tree is, but also part of this wider sense of beinghood. Now, that therefore is really clear. Joanna Macy is a good guide here. Joanna Macy makes very clear that r pain, suffering, that sense of pain is really important to recognise. Why is it important to recognise? Because it is an indication to yourself that you are suffering the pain both of the other, so it shows that compassion, that sympathy and that empathy, but you're also recognising the pain within yourself. So that's to say that you are part of that woodland that's being, that's being uh, deforested. You are part of that that land, that wild land that is being converted to wasteland. The wild land without and the wild land within are part of the same wild land as is the wasteland without and the wasteland within. All that's needed is the brave knight to come and restore the balance and restore the harmony of the wasteland. Okay, so recognition of that pain is, a, is an understanding that the pain derives from the, the axe wound against the neck. It's a really important position to understand that, and I find that one of those, one of those integral flips um, at the heart of this whole uh, exploration of the wild, that the wild is within and the wild is without. And a very fertile place to explore that is children's stories and children's literature. And um, for the, um, at Christchurch, at the University of Christchurch in Canterbury, um, now over a year ago I gave a talk when we explored um, Where the Wild Things Are by Maurice Sendak, looking at this tension of the domestic and the wild, um, that which lies within the domesticated sphere, the domus, the home, and that which lies without, and of course the transgression of one and the other. And in fact, it's the heart of good children's literature, is always like the tiger who came to tea. It's the, the transgression, the movement of the wild outside and the wild inside. Um, it's a very fertile ground for exploration. So, let's move on, let's move on. The flip I've been exploring in these different modes of, 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 of turning towards. And where does this leave me? It leaves me thinking about why this is important. Why is wilding, a, uh, uh, to me, a very positive uh, language, discourse and practice? Why is it important? Because it brings hope. It brings hope. Now, hope I, is a very interesting word. It's a very ancient word. Hope stretches back, scarcely changed, either in in as it's in 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 um, in its in its in its construction, and so it seems in its meaning, going all the way back to our Proto-Indo-European roots. The word hope is integral, as is hunger, as is. Uh, as is thirst, as is fatigue, as is excitement, as is joy. Hope is a very integral human experience. Why? Because hope is the expectation of something better to come, the expectation of, of something that is going to come. It needn't be better. Hope is what keeps us moving. Hope is at the heart of the wild. Hope is this, what Thomas Hardy calls the ancient pulse of germ and birth that ancient pulse of germ and birth that keeps coming back and keeps coming back and keeps coming back and keeps coming back. It can't be put down. So therefore, wilding gives me great hope because wilding, to use the expression of Ralph Waldo Emerson, wilding is hitching your wagon to a star and that star is growing, that star is moving, that star will continue to move because the wasteland will always return, become the wild land. The wild land will always return. No matter how industrious our efforts to clear the lands and to create a sterile wasteland, our civilized mission 
has cracks and it crumbles and it always has crumbled and it always will crumble and the wild will always return. So therefore wilding is hopeful, it brings hope because on the one hand it is channeling, it is forming alliances, it is working with this great power of the world around us, of the wild. It is that ancient pulse. And therefore, rather than resisting it, which is a great effort, it's a great effort to resist the wild, to keep everything cut back, to keep the hedgerows flailed, to keep the trees cut down. They, cut, they come back again. Try cutting down a willow and you'll see what I mean. It comes back and it comes back and it comes back. Even when you, as I've seen people put those poison pellets in the, will in the willow, the willow returns. So the wild, t wilding is turning our attention and turning our will towards that will of the wild, towards that unstoppable will. And I'm going to end with just a, a little linguistic expression related in Spanish, and I love this. The word uh, to hope in Spanish is esperar, which is also to wait. Um, and in fact, they have similar uh, roots in the Latin expectare, um, which has got um, spectare within it, to look. So it's to look outside, to look beyond. Um, and that is both hope and wait. It's, 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 a, it's a wonderful conflation of these two ideas. And therefore, as an imperative, you will often hear somebody saying, espera, 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 wait, wait. And I like to think of it in the other term. And I like to think of it as somebody putting their hand up and saying, Hope! 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 And there I'll end. Espera! <laughs>